Hirokoto Katara. No mai ki tene fari wadanga otato. Welcome to this University of Arts. I am Professor Neil Dodgson from the Faculty of Engineering, and today we're talking about facial recognition technology. Is it a great enabler or is it a threat to liberty? I will talk first about the technical aspects, and I'll hand over to my distinguished colleague, Nessa Lynch, from the Faculty of Law, to talk about the legal, ethical, moral issues. So I think I get the easy part. So let's start by thinking about human beings as facial recognition people. You are really good at recognizing faces. In fact, there are bits of your brain that are especially designed to recognize faces, Faces. Babies as young as 10 minutes old start recognizing faces. It's actually inbuilt. So you can recognize that this is 15 photos of the same person, even though you may never have seen this person before. Now, the computer has a bit more of a problem than we do. Um, the computer might get thrown by somebody wearing sunglasses, and the early Facial recognition algorithms did get thrown, you just had to put on sunglasses and it didn't recognize you. They get thrown by not seeing the face front on, and you actually need software to correct for that, to um, adjust the picture so it is front on. If you wear a smart hat, or at the bottom a silly hat, that also messes up facial recognition, though you're not having too many problems as a human being, the computer is, and what really messes computers up is bad lighting. We, as human beings, have incredibly good visual processing systems that can compensate for bad lighting because we've had to deal with it since when we were tiny. Computers have real problems with that. But there was another problem with this set of 15 photos, which is that one of them is not of me. Can anyone spot which one is not of me? Yeah. Bill Gates. That's Bill Gates. <laughs> what is Bill Gates doing in a doing here. Well, the other day I was walking across a car park in Wellington and this bloke called out to me, hey mate, did you know you look like Bill Gates? <laughs> to which the answer was, well, yes I actually did. So what's going on there? He's never seen me before, but he sees somebody walking across the car park and the visual processing, the facial recognition in his brain is going, I know that person, I know that person, who is that? Trying to find a match and goes, oh that's Bill Gates. Hang on, this is Wellington and Bill Gates is in America. Hmm, it's not Bill Gates. So hence, hey mate, do you know you look like Bill Gates? So human beings get it wrong. We've got really good facial recognition, but we do get it wrong. So how do we train a computer to do this? Now having looked into this, there are four different ways, big, big mechanisms that we have tried as engineers to get facial recognition to work. And you'll be happy to know I'm only going to talk about one of them, the one that works most effectively today, which is artificial intelligence. In the middle there, that section of boxes is a convolutional neural network. And what you do is you start with a convolutional neural network that knows nothing about human faces. You feed a face into it, and it tells you who it thinks this is. And of course it gets it wrong. It knows nothing about faces. But on the right-hand side, we design a loss function which tells the computer just how wrong it is. Because we know who the face is, the system doesn't, so we can tell it how wrong it is. And by knowing how wrong it is, it goes and retrains the convolutional neural network. It just pushes it a little bit towards being right. So you put another face in, it gives an answer which is wrong, you train it some more. So if you put lots of faces in, and by lots I mean millions or tens of millions of faces, you train it on tens of millions of faces where you know who the person is. You tell the computer this is the face, you tell it who it is, it tries to guess from the face who it is, and gradually it trains, and it can get really, really good at this. Um, we're not quite sure what's going on inside the box once it's trained, but it does work. So once you've got the thing trained, you put a, a photograph to the system, and it will give you its best guess as to who this is. And assuming that the person is somebody it was trained on, it will give you a reasonably good guess. Not perfect, but a reasonably good guess. So we can do this, works really well, and it works really well on big groups of people. So how do we use this? Well, there are two modalities for using facial recognition. One I've called confirmation, which is saying, is that really you? 
I want his identification, saying, who is that? So let's talk about these two. Confirmation. This is where you have some token, something that says, this is who I claim to be. So for example, my iPhone. It knows I am the person holding this phone should be Neil Dodgson. I have registered my face with this phone, so when I look at it, it unlocks itself. And I've got really used to the phone just unlocking itself naturally without me having to touch anything, just by looking at me with its camera. Somebody else looks at the phone, they are pretending to be me as far as the system's concerned because they've got my phone. Equally, when you go to uh, the border, you hand over your passport that says, this is who I say I am. And the facial recognition system then says, is that really you? Or maybe there are some banking systems where instead of typing in a pin, use a camera to recognize, is that really you? So it's confirming that you're you. And these systems can be tuned. And you can tune it from always recognizing you to never recognizing you. Obviously, never recognizing you is useless. So um, recognizing you nine times out of 10 is pretty good. So with my phone, recognizes me nine times out of 10. The Apple iPhone actually gives you five goes. So if it recognizes you nine times out of 10 and it's got five goes to get it right, it gets it right almost all the time. So what I mean by recognizing me nine times out of 10 is you can move the slider. So I could get it so it recognizes me 99 times out of 1,000. And if you're not an engineer, you will be sitting there saying, why don't you just move the slider down to the end where it always gets it right? And that's because there's a trade-off here. If it always recognizes me, it will always recognize anybody as me. It will basically say, oh, look, there's a face. That must be Neil. So we actually have to um, trade off when it gets it right and when it gets it wrong. So here's about right. Gets me right nine times out of 10, and somebody else steals my phone, they've got a one in a thousand chance that it will think it's me. That's about what you want. But Apple tell me that it's actually a one in a million chance that it will get it wrong. And you can move the slider up and down depending on whether it's, we don't really care too much if it gets it wrong, but we really do worry about annoying the customer. Uh, at the left hand end, two at the right hand end, this is a military base, if it gets it wrong you know, two times in three, that's still pretty good because we want to make sure that nobody who's not allowed in gets in. Now the harder problem, because if the system knows this is supposed to be you, they're just trying to check that the face matches you. The harder problem is having a massive database of faces and by giving it a random photo and saying, who is this? And this is where your C computational neural network, your AI system comes in. So who is this? Uh, the problem here is there are no certainties. The system's working on probabilities. So here it's come back with the top three matches. There's a 78% match with a picture on the left, a 74% match with a picture in the middle, a 65% match with a picture on the right. What do you do as a user of the system? Do you say, oh, just give me the best match? Or do you say, as a human being, give me the top three, the top 10, the top 50, and I, as a human, will now work out which one it should be? So in this case, it's actually got it right. But the interesting thing is those, those two first matches are sisters and even other human beings occasionally mistake them for each other. So if human beings are getting this wrong, and they do actually look quite different to me, um, then the computer's going to get it wrong too. There is no certainty in facial recognition. And the problem gets harder the more people there are in the database. So thinking about you and how many people you can recognize, we estimate that a human being can really, really recognize well about 300 people. That's your little tribal group of 300. And probably the limit on human beings is about 3,000. So that's the celebrities you see on TV, Bill Gates, that sort of thing. There are 5 million people in New Zealand. You couldn't possibly remember all 5 million faces in New Zealand. And it's actually quite hard for the computer. There are 1.2 billion people in China. That makes the problem even harder. And there are 8 billion people in the world. So if you have a database of all the faces in the world, the chances of it getting it wrong are incredibly high. So what happens when things go wrong? Well, what happens when that confirmation goes wrong? Uh, you get locked out. So in this case, you get locked out of your home. If you install the facial recognition lock on your house, you risk getting locked out when it fails to recognize your face properly. Now, you're unlikely to install a facial recognition lock on your house, but what if your office installs facial recognition? Instead of scanning an ID card, we just go to facial recognition, 
and then it doesn't recognize your face one morning, and you can't get in through the security door. Or you can't get into your bank account because it doesn't recognize your face. You can't go and get a new face to replace the old face. It has to work with the face you've got. Or what if you're at passport control and you get locked out of your own country? Now, what happens today in these circumstances is this computer says no, and a security guard wanders over and says, oh, who are you? Let's look at your ID. Yeah, that's you. In you go. Computer got it wrong. What happens when we trust these systems enough that the security guard says, no, computer said no, and that means that is not who you are. You can't change your face. And here is a case where recognition did fail in the identification side of things. This is Robert Williams. He, in January 2020, he's the first person to have been arrested because computerized facial recognition failed. He was, a, he, the computer made a match between a photo from a heist at a jewelry store and him. So the police came to his house. They arrested him in front of his two daughters and his wife. It's America, so they handcuffed him behind his back, and they were not very gentle. Threw him in the car, took him down to the station for questioning. They questioned him for some time, and eventually they showed him a printout of the photo from the jewelry store that had been matched with him. And he picked it up and looked at this photo and held it up next to his face and said, no, this is not me. Do you think all black men look alike? Now, that last bit was probably not helpful. But the detective looked at the photo and looked at him and said, no, that, that is not you. The computer must have got it wrong. They still held him in detention for 30 hours, and it took five months for him to clear his name, even though the detective said it wasn't a match, and he had an alibi for where he was at the time. And he only got his name cleared when the New York Times got involved five months later. So, things can go wrong when you start trusting this stuff. So can you escape it? So this is um, called Dazzle Paint. It's used by protesters to try to fool facial recognition by painting your face with a bunch of patterns that fool the facial recognition algorithms. It worked really well until about 2015, when the facial recognition algorithms got better and they, went, they just ignore the paint and they get it right. So the only thing you can really do these days is wear a mask. Now, are you going to walk around Wellington with a mask on? No, you're not. But if you're going to protest, you might decide you want to, which is why certain regimes, which I won't name, are making it illegal to wear a mask at a protest. So that's worrying. OK. So this wouldn't be a, a university talk without a little thought about where we're going next. So where are we going next with this? this is, I've already talked about where we are. So what's next? What's next is recognizing emotions on your face. So this is something you do really well as a human being. When you look at another person and talk to them, you can work out their mental state from how their face looks. You can tell if they're happy or sad, or interested or bored, or confused or tired, and you can do that just by looking at their face. Well, computers can do that too. My friend Rana El Kaloubi, who I worked with at Cambridge, has set up a company to exploit this, which has just been bought out. And the use case for this is it's super amazing. It's an amazing enabler. Imagine you sit your child in front of an online tutoring system, and the online tutoring system can tell whether your child is confused interested, engaged, bored, and based on how the child is feeling, the online tutoring system can adjust how it teaches your child in the same way a human tutor would. That's super exciting. It could revolutionize how we do online tutoring. However, imagine now that your office decides to install this on the computer that you sit at for eight hours a day, to check whether you're interested, bored, engaged, concentrating, tired. Imagine if your office decides that you have to be happy for the whole time that you are at work. 
Anybody who has worked in hospitality will know how hard it is to appear happy to the clients all the time. So imagine if your employer is tracking your emotions all the time. Then imagine if the state gets involved, and this is a news item from just last week from the BBC News, a certain government is testing AI emotion, emotion detection software on the Uyghur people. And I will leave it to you to imagine whether the Uyghurs who are involved in this are volunteers or not. So with that horrifying thought, I'm going to hand over to Nessa Lynch to talk about the legal side of this. And I'm going to very welcome to Victoria University and to the Pipitia campus. Um, so it's so inspiring to see so many people turn out for a lunchtime lecture on what is quite a niche area of research. Um, and it's clear that there's a really high degree of public interest in this topic at the moment. Um, so thank you so much, Neil, for giving an insight into the science and also, I think, foreshadowing some of those ideas around um, the impact of society. Um, so I'm going to continue the conversation and look at um, what are some of the legal regulatory frameworks and what are some of the benefits and threats of this technology. Um, and then we're hoping to leave a decent amount of time for questions um, and comments. Uh, so first, some acknowledgements. So uh, a lot of the ideas and uh, frameworks that I'm going to talk about today um, arise from a research project that I led over 2019-2020. And so this was generously funded by the Law Foundation. Um, and my acknowledgement to my author team, so uh, Martin is here in the audience as well, so you can direct any difficult questions to him later. Um, and acknowledge our research assistant team as well. Um, so the report is publicly available, so I'll be giving a high level sketch today, but certainly if you want to read up on any more of the ideas, um, please look at that report. Um, so I also want to acknowledge, um, which is public knowledge, that I'm part of a team that's carrying out an independent review um, for New Zealand Police on the use of the technology at the moment. Um, and I'm also involved in giving uh, informal advice to other central government agencies. And also I have a role on the Data Ethics Advisory Group. So just very much emphasising that anything I say today are my, definitely my own views. Um, so in terms of what I'd like to do over my time is I'd like to run uh, about four or five scenarios past you um, of different use cases and those are designed to tease out some of the ideas around what is the impact or potential impact um, this technology could have on our rights and interests so in terms of our individual rights as people, our collective rights um, and our societal rights. I want to talk then about uh, some of the current regulation of this technology um, and maybe foreshadow some gaps that there might be. And then I want to spend my last few minutes just looking at what are some potential options for regulation in the future. So particularly looking at some uh, initiatives that are happening in other jurisdictions. So first thing as I want to do, as I said, is run some hypothetical scenarios past you. So I've got five of them. They're pretty simple and they're definitely hypothetical, um, so don't worry about some of these things. Um, they're not in force at the moment. Um, but I just want you to start thinking about what are some of the interests and rights um, that could potentially affect us in these scenarios. So I'll go through them reasonably quickly. Um, and I just want you to think about whether you think these uses are justified, do they cause you some disquiet, or would you be quite comfortable? So the first one, um, which I think Neil had foreshadowed already. So you come to work after Christmas, um, employers got a new access system, so all of us are always using or losing our swipe cards and trying to remember logons and that. So it's going to let you straight into the building, uh, let you log on to your workstation, um, and you don't need to remember any codes. It's just going to print the documents out when it sees you. All right, so think about whether you think that's okay. All right, what about a second one? So you, you attend an alumni function, and so like you did today, you come in, and the person, the staff member, greets you really warmly by name. Lovely to have you back. And so what's happened there is a facial recognition camera um, has matched your face to the photo that the university holds from your student ID. Um, it appears on the staff member's iPad, and so they greet you really warmly. 
um, and they direct you over to a table where there's some people who are there from your year group. Um, so you feel really warmly welcomed um, and special. All right, so moving um, more to the law enforcement. So say you've got a police force and they've lawfully acquired a huge amount of CCTV footage um, from public spaces in a city. So instead, um, and so they're looking for, they have a suspect and they're looking for various dates and times that a suspect has been in particular places. And so it's a serious offense, it's a suspected homicide. So instead of those officers sitting in front of a computer and going through uh, thousands of hours of footage um, and trying to identify their person, um, so they're gonna use the software to search a facial image and um, which will just pop out where that person has been in the footage. So, Really good, really time saving for those people. All right, so what about we have a private venue that's hosting um, a trade show for arms manufacturers. Uh, so they've had this event before and there was quite a big protest, very disruptive, some damage. Um, so this year they're gonna partner with police and they're gonna set up a van that's equipped with facial recognition cameras. Um, that's going to scan the crowd and they've got a watch list of people who have been arrested before at different protests um, they've been arrested for disorder etc it's going to run against them and if there's a match um, there's a police employee who's going to make a decision as to whether uh, other police officers are alerted and that person is apprehended Okay, so last one. Say we've got uh, really credible information about a potential terrorist attack in a city. Um, so in this city, they've got a network of fixed CCTV cameras in public places, um, and there's an, the ability to switch on a facial recognition um, technology capability. Uh, so the cameras around in public spaces and public transport. Uh, so they have this credible threat, um, they have the reasonable suspicion, and so what they do is they make an application to a judge, and that judge is going to give permission for a specific period of time where we switch on this capability, um, and then we run a series of specified images against the watch list. All right, so what we've done there, um, hopefully through that scenario, is explored just a limited amount of some of the use cases that are put forward under a number of headings. Um, so things like access, security, um, crime control, um, etc. So hopefully in your mind you should be thinking about some of the rights and interests and considerations that are at play here. Um, so if we think of some of the things that we might class as, as benefits, um, so obviously we want to be safe when we're going around our business and our life. Um, we want uh, there to be less crime. Um, we want to reduce harm. Um, obviously the state has a duty to investigate and prosecute crime. Uh, we want, we're, we're tremendously interested in efficiency and we want convenience um, and we want security. But also I suppose thinking about other types of rights, we've got a large range of human rights that arise from international and national sources. Um, we know that facial images uh, through Neil's presentation, um, we've seen that they're a particularly sensitive type of data. And I suppose what's interesting as well is unlike other types of biometrics, say um, DNA and fingerprints, uh, they can be collected at a, at a distance without your consent and you might not even know that it's happening. Um, so we've seen through the scenarios that we might be affecting a large range of our interests there. So we've got uh, an interest in a right in privacy and um, to respect for our private life. Um, so that extends as well to our, our private life and public spaces. Um, we've got particular human rights um, and processes that are, arise in the context of criminal justice. Um, so unreasonable search and, uh, prohibition against unreasonable search and seizure. Um, rules around surveillance and we've got rights to gather to protest um, and we've got the right to be free to, uh, from discrimination so we've also looked as well about other types of constraint um, so we've got things like um, for instance consent um, opt-in opt-out um, we also saw in those scenarios that there were questions of human oversight or questions perhaps of independent authorization um, by a judge all right, so what I want to do now um, is just to talk a little bit about what law, policy, regulation um, and constraints that we have at the moment. Um, so 
before we think about what additional regulation we might have, let's think about what's there at the moment. Um, so probably when we talk about regulation, I would personally class it into two um, parts. I think first of all are the rules um, around how we actually collect, um, retain and share these images. And the second is the application of the technology itself. Uh, so we've got a huge amount of ways in which, uh, both in the private sector and the public sector, that our images can be collected, retained and shared. Um, so we've got formal processes, so if you apply for a passport, a driving license, um, if you, uh, I suppose in the private sector, various access control, you give your photo to social media would be another one. Um, We've got, in the policing space, we've got custody images, so if you're arrested, uh, a formal image will be taken of you and can be uh, retained after you've been convicted. Um, so we've got many ways that our image can be collected and retained, both by the state and the private sector. Um, so I'll admit that's something that did actually, I wasn't quite aware of um, before we started this research project, and I think I speak for my colleagues on that research project as well is that certainly I was not aware of the amount of information sharing that goes on across the state um, and internationally in a certain sense as well around um, biometric data. Um, so this is for very good reasons, so identity fraud, uh, genuine need for information sharing, um, I suppose after the situation um, where somebody breached the border under corrections. Um, uh, and uh, fled to another country um, and was uh, taken back here, there was a lot of discussion around identity matching and some legislation put into place. Um, but I think it should be quite important for us to have more of a national conversation around some of that information sharing and the extent to which it happens and the extent to which um, we can consent or opt in and out of that. Um, so that's one conversation. So obviously um, social media and the private sector um, is another uh, whole area there around um, sharing of facial images. Uh, another important area here is the idea of the public space. Um, so we think of the public space as Lambton Quay and um, the beach and other spaces where we gather. Um, so traditionally the idea is there of course that unless you have a reasonable expectation of privacy, somebody can take a photo of you. Um, that's been in the news a bit recently. Um, but it also extends I think more recently to the online public sphere. So we spend quite a lot of time on the internet these days, it's our public square. Um, so the rules around how we collect um, and retain data, facial images from the online public sphere. So we've also got then what we would more traditionally call the search and surveillance sphere, which is the search and surveillance legislation covering law enforcement, and obviously the intelligence and security agencies have their own rules as well. Um, so these rules are about essentially when can law enforcement gather information um, themselves, or when do they need independent authorization in terms of a judicial officer um, or some type of independent authorization. So obviously when we're collecting and retaining and sharing public our um, personal data, sorry, um, we've got our Privacy Act and the various regulations um, which give us guidance around the proper regime for um, collecting this and sharing it. Something that we've seen a proliferation of in the last couple of years as well is government standards around data ethics um, and the algorithm charter. So these would be very much at the regulation or principle stage, so trying to guide um, the public use of if we use an algorithm, these are the rules that we will use, we have human oversight, um, it's fair, etc. Uh, consent can be another huge one, so particularly in the private sector we might say you've consented to enter this retail premises or um, you've consented to buy this particular program or you've opted in or opted out in some way, so that can underpin as well and um, the use of the technology or the retention of your data. Uh, so the indigenous data sovereignty movement um, again has been a development in the last couple of years coming to the fore. So thinking about the special rules and considerations where we um, gather, collect and retain um, data from indigenous peoples. Uh, social license can be another constraint and this is something which um, I think has become very prevalent in pandemic times. So we've talked a lot about if you imagine two years ago that we would be scanning in and out or 
that we couldn't leave the country or enter the country or um, that would we have ever thought that that was the case. Um, so this is this idea that a huge change in circumstances, the Christchurch terror incident, um, the pandemic, that those can really change our ideas around what's acceptable and what's normal. Uh, reputational risk, which is obviously very important for commercial entities, has driven um, some of the constraints as well. Um, so particularly in the US around the Black Lives Matter movement, we saw some of the big technology companies um, self-regulate and say, we are going to ban ourselves from using this technology or we're going to ban ourselves from selling this technology to particular types of entities. Um, so that's that reputational risk driving companies. Okay, so lastly what I'd like to do, um, and just leading into then our time for questions and comments, um, is to think about some regulatory considerations. Um, so if we think about the idea that we don't have a lot of specific regulation for facial recognition technology, and um, that it affects a lot of our rights and interests, how, how might we regulate? So I'm going to talk as well about some overseas jurisdictions um, that are grappling with this question at the moment. So something that we see a lot of in the literature and uh, particularly media around facial recognition technology are kind of phrases like reclaim your face, ban the scan, and this idea that we should completely ban facial recognition technology. Um, but I suppose what I would urge here is to think back to some of our spectrum of usage. So are we going to ban Neil from using his face to open his own phone? Um, or are we going to ban people from using facial recognition technology to apply for their passport from home? So I think we've got to think of some of the nuances of this. And so indeed I was reading the other day about a county in Washington in the US who has banned facial recognition technology in their county. But it was interesting that the mayor of that particular town said immediately, but of course this is not going to affect or um, participation in some national schemes like uh, using facial recognition technology to find missing children and also to identify faces of victims and child exploitation materials. Um, and I think he also mentioned about some federal schemes for anti-terror legislation. So they had made a big show of we're not going to have any government um, facial recognition in our town, in our county, but they'd already thought about here are some justifications for it. Um, it is my view, I think, when people talk about banning, what they're usually talking about is the live biometric tracking. So by that mean, we mean what I was talking about, setting up a camera, setting up a van of cameras and actually doing live tracking of people and running their face against that live footage um, rather than those more one-on-one -on -one methods. Um, so we've certainly seen moratorium, moratoria um, on that in other jurisdictions. So for instance, uh, Police Scotland did a public consultation, um, ran a select committee process, and they've decided to actually put that off. So they said, we were going to introduce it in 2026, but we've spoken to our communities and we think we're actually going to put this on pause. We're not going to buy this technology. Um, so we've seen that type of situation um, happening overseas. Uh, and certainly, obviously, some of those uh, advocacy messages have filtered into this jurisdiction as well. Another option would be to actually restrain the use of the technology through legislation. Um, so some of you may uh, have had a look at the new European Union draft AI strategy and rules. Um, so that's really interesting because it's actually tried to grapple with this question of how would we regulate live biometric um, tracking? So what the EU would do um, would be to actually restrict it to very particular situations and say, um, in a publicly accessible space, it would have to be locating a missing child or dealing with really high-end offending such as terrorism. Um, so really confining it down to a very serious situation. And they would also apply that, interestingly, to the retrospective analysis. Uh, something that's been called for for a while by the Law Commission and others has been a review uh, or to implement some of the uh, suggested reviews of the search and surveillance legislation. So particularly as I mentioned that idea of surveillance in the public space is not well regulated at the moment. A lot of our ideas around search and surveillance um, are about individuals rather than um, collective or societal surveillance. Um, so the Law Commission has certainly made some recommendations around policy statements in that space. 
Um, so as part of our report, uh, we recommended, I think, looking at the EU rules again, the GDPR, and thinking about biometric data as being a special class, um, so that it is highly personal information and ha should have some stricter rules around it, around when it can be collected, retained, or shared. Um, so obviously, one of our recommendations was good quality privacy impact assessments. So. Uh, in the private sector or the public sector when we are thinking about implementing technology and um, that we've thought very carefully about the privacy um, and the impact of what we're going to do. Uh, governance and oversight. So some other jurisdictions have a lot more governance and oversight around um, this type of collection, retention and sharing um, and the technology. Um, so for instance, I wouldn't particularly I think it's a fantastic model, but certainly it's been an effort. Um, so in the United Kingdom, um, they have a biometrics commissioner. Well, they used to have a biometrics commissioner and a surveillance camera commissioner. It's now the same person. Um, so the role has merged. But that's somebody who is thinking about um, regulating the biometric data, is carrying out audits, is issuing policy statements, and keeping a general eye on how the state is collecting this data um, and how it's being used. Um, and the last thing I'd like to think about, uh, or get you to think about, is what ways do we have for citizens to raise their concerns and their complaints? Um, because the, really the only uh, common law jurisdiction that's had a court of appeal, a high level case, has been England and Wales, which was the Bridges decision, which was um, a man who took a judicial review against the South Wales police because he had been scanned by a camera a facial recognition camera in a van. Um, so that sort of action couldn't happen in New Zealand because it would be very hard for us, an individual citizen who's been affected, to bring a judicial review on human rights grounds. So we don't have a lot of those mechanisms that other jurisdictions have for taking a complaint. Um, so what I, I would urge us um, to think about what ways could we have for citizens who know they've been affected by public surveillance um, or uh, private sector um, to have ways to raise concerns. So we do obviously have the Privacy Commissioner, we've got the Human Rights Commissioner, um, maybe they need more resourcing or more powers, um, but that is certainly something that I would leave um, to you is how do we as individual citizens, um, if we think we've been affected, um, how do we think about um, making complaints about our rights? All right, I better finish up there um, so that we have some time. Um, so uh, I think, Neil, do you want to come back up again and we'll, we'll take some questions? Um, so thank you very much for your attention and we're happy to take some questions.